This video contains pixelated depictions of fictional blood and gore, as well as occasional flashing lights and spoilers for classic Doom. I've talked about Doom to a lot on my channel before. Many times. So many goddamn times. And that's for a very good reason. Because Doom 2 sits at the very top of my favorite FPS games of all time. No, games period. Few shooters have this perfect balance of exciting combat, interesting exploration and engaging levels. Yes, Doom 2 truly stands as one of the best games I've ever played in my entire life. It is also the worst of the classic Doom titles. My god does it suck. In my Doom 64 video, many viewers felt I was unnecessarily harsh to the game. Some even pointed out that I prefer Doom 2, which has many of the same flaws. A uh, hypocrisy much? Not really. I'm always insanely critical of the pieces of media I enjoy. If you ever hear me not talk about a game, not even negatively, that means I truly don't like it. But I do love Doom 2, and so I'd like to give a fair review on it. Since just because you like something, that doesn't mean you can't criticize it, and just because you criticize it, that doesn't mean you can't like it. So as we've run out of ado, let's get right into the positives. First up, the Super Shotgun. Come on, you knew this was coming. What a perfectly designed weapon. It just absolutely decimates everything in your path, and then gets rid of the other 90% too. Enemies that were previously massive obstacles like Hecademons are now much easier to deal with. You can criticize the game for not adding many weapons, but with this beauty, I think they did more than enough. The long trend of double barrel shotguns in video games can be traced all the way back to this title, and I think that's only commendable. Second positive, the enemy variety. Doom 1 had around 6 or 7 enemies, with 2 bosses that only appear once. Doom 2 on the other hand, it adds another 7, plus one that appears in secret levels. It even brought back the Spider Mastermind and Cyber Demon as recurring foes. And these new enemies really add a lot to the experience. Some, like the Mancubus, a bit more than others like the Hell Knight, but they all have their place. Let's also not forget the fact that some of these new enemies are even more iconic than those from Doom 1. The Revenant is arguably the face of Doom at this point, even more than the Cyber Demon. The third positive is the amount of levels. The first Doom had 27 stages in total, which isn't too far from Doom 2's 32. However, out of those levels, 3 were optional secrets, and another 3 were boss stages without any real progression. This brings the amount of levels the average player would experience down to around 21. While Doom 2 also has secret levels, it only counts for 2 of them. There are also only 2 boss stages in the form of Dead Simple and the Icon of Sin. So you really get more bang for your buck here. And these levels are also much larger, which is positive number 4. Just compare the Citadel to the Unholy Cathedral or Gotcha in Mount Erebus. Of course, bigger doesn't automatically mean better, but it does utilize Doom's movement engine more. Which becomes really obvious during those massive battles like the one in the courtyard, the spirit world, refueling base and especially suburbs. Even amongst other games at the time, Doom 2 really stood out in that regard. And not only are many of these levels larger, but they're also often far less linear. This isn't necessarily an upside either, as open-ended isn't better than straightforward, but it adds to the replay value. There are so many nooks and crannies with items that you can get before even glancing at a keycard. You can do that in Doom 1 as well, but how many maps allow you to travel across the entire level without opening a single door? Mount Erebus is rightfully praised as one of the best Doom 1 maps for this reason, and Doom 2 has several of them. Overall, Doom 2 does a lot of things right and improves on Doom 1's formula in many ways. It really does everything a sequel should do. Oh, if only we could stop here. If only this video was just 5 minutes long. But it's not and we're not done here. Because here come the negatives. Starting with the very first negative of them all. The Super Shotgun. Yeah, didn't expect that one, did ya? It's fantastic at eliminating demons, but also at doing the same thing to the rest of the arsenal. I barely ever even use the regular shotgun once I obtain it, because why would I? If I wanted to hit enemies from afar, I can use the chain gun. And anything closer gets pulverized by the super shotgun. You can even use it on enemies that used to require the chain gun to take out, demoting that one to mowing down hordes of zombies. 
Even the rocket launcher is less useful since the super shotgun does comparable damage minus the risk of hurting yourself. It's a fantastic addition, but it doesn't complement the other weapons that well. Doom 1's arsenal is already barren as the fists of pistol almost never get used. So to add several other weapons to that list feels poorly thought out. A long range rifle to snipe enemies would have replaced the chain gun's ability to do so, but not much else. A grenade launcher could have dealt with enemies below, but not from afar, meaning it wouldn't outlast the rocket launcher. But the super shotgun… yeah, it's just straight up better. The second negative is the level presentation. Stages are bigger, but also way emptier than before. This issue was already present in Doom 1, especially in Sandy's maps. But considering he created most of the Doom 2 ones, it's even more apparent here. Just look at Monster Kondo. What is this giant room for? There are no enemies, no secrets, it's just… there. And do the Chasm and Gotcha really need to be that big, especially when 90% of it will just kill you? It really seems more like they were excited to be able to create larger levels without having anything in mind they wanted to put in them. And it's not like they're brilliantly decorated either. There are so many misaligned or unfitting textures across all maps. Even some enemies are stuck inside walls or each other. Which is perfectly understandable considering how quickly the game came out, but it's not acceptable. That isn't even mentioning the inconsistent texture usage. In the spirit world, this cracked floor hurts you in the big hole at the start, but not in the spider mastermind room. There's even a throw made of lava that somehow doesn't damage you either. A similar cracked floor texture is harmful in maps like industrial zone and blood falls, but also not in tricks and traps. And the courtyard is the worst example since it uses switch textures as decoration all over. It just sends the player mixed messages and means they can't actually rely on their knowledge to tackle these maps. Because what works at one level might not in another. It's cheap and unfair. And that brings me to the third negative. The many, many, really unfair moments. Good god, where do I begin? How about tricks and traps, which can outright kill you just before the exit with no way out? That one's really fun in the console ports where you can't quick save. I had to redo that whole level like 5 times on PS1 before admitting defeat and skipping to the next one. The Citadel has a similar trap. See this pit with the inviting box of rockets? Items in Toxic Group usually signify that it's safe to go down there, but not here. Nope, if you didn't raise the floor beforehand, you're just dead. Sucks to suck. Or maybe you can see the trap right away, but getting past it is the problem. Like barrels are fun where you need to run from several exploding barrels immediately. Try doing that one with the controller. And lest we forget how often the game loves teleporting you inside hordes of enemies with no way out. The factory does this. Nirvana does it too, and if you step forward a little, it reveals even more monsters. Oh, and it's not just Peter's no guilty of this. Even Romero's The Living End teleports you in front of tons of enemies. These are the levels that taught me to always ready my BFG right before stepping through Unknown Teleporter simply because of how often I died to things I didn't even know were gonna be there. Is that a fun challenge? And hey Romero, did you know you can put teleporters in the lava? It makes it so the player isn't screwed when they fall into it because there's no way they'll make it back in time. No? Cool. Even if the game doesn't punish you by killing you for not knowing these things, it does so in other ways. In suburbs, there's a secret room inside the red brick house, hidden behind a fake wall. This isn't quite that unfair because if you open the right door, you can hear Kaki demons hissing at you when they spot you. Unless you're not playing on ultra violence because they don't spawn on the easier difficulties. Sure, you could press yourself up against the corpses every time, but who does that? Are we really back to wall humping? I thought that died out with Wolfen's F3D. It just punishes inexperienced players for no reason. And I wouldn't even complain if the room didn't contain the freaking BFG 9000. The one weapon players could really use for the pawn battle if they're not that good at the game. These are all just beginner's traps and are among the worst ways of adding difficulty to games. The player should be able to rely on their wits and skills, not be scared of every new room. And the fourth negative is just as bad. It's something I heavily criticize Doom 64 for. Cryptic progression. This originally began as early as the second map, as David X. Newton explains. 
Famously, Doom 2's Underhauls had this problem, where players in 1994 were confronted with a set of silver bars early on, and were unsure how to get them out the way. Nothing like this had appeared in the iWads before this point, so players thought they would have to be opened remotely, and the thought of just walking up to them and pressing use didn't occur to them. For that reason, they were removed from later versions of the iWad. And they realised a similar problem in Downtown, which didn't actually have the infamous arrow on the beta version. Now, I've said before that I don't think the arrow is that big of a deal, and I still think so. The player is going to end up in the red building eventually, and it's not like other maps don't use arrows as well. But getting around the map is incredibly tedious. You can't actually get inside all buildings normally, instead you have to take random teleporters. This problem appears on a later map, the Citadel. Even the teleporters in the red brick building don't help. Until Simi pointed it out, I never realized that this was supposed to be an overview of the map. And even then, unless you already know which teleporter to take, and there's five of them, chances are you'll have to pick them at random. Hold a gun to my head and I genuinely couldn't tell you how you're supposed to proceed through the map. I've already mentioned the courtyard's inconsistent switches earlier, but they actually mess this up as soon as the level starts. As David again puts it, the courtyard in Doom 2 paradoxically does this really badly even though it presents the player with almost the exact same scenario. It starts the player off in a small room with no obvious exits, and they can't progress until they've worked out the new mechanic of having to shoot the door to open it. This is bad for three reasons. It comes very late in the game after no previous indication that shootable switches even existed. Secondly, the same texture has been used before to indicate a door that's directly openable by the player, causing unnecessary confusion when they find they can't open it this time. But most of all, the introduction of this mechanic goes nowhere. Unlike the eye switches in Sigil becoming a repeating theme of the level set, this setup never appears again and the player doesn't get to learn anything from it. But he is wrong about one thing. Shootable walls do reappear in the spirit world. Except this time they don't even use a texture that would indicate that. How is anyone supposed to figure this one out? There are no hints or arrows or anything. And this one is mandatory. At least the courtyard stops you right away. The spirit world? Yeah, have fun running around confused because you didn't know this random part of the wall is actually worth investigating. And you also have to open a non-door in the living end. Sure, you don't need to shoot this one, but what is this? That's something you'd use to hide a secret, not the only way forward. Yeah, Romero is still not exempt from these issues. Industrial Zone is a fantastic map and again one of my favorites. But do you know how to get the red key? You take a random teleporter of course. Except it just leads to a random hole in the floor that doesn't go anywhere. No, instead you have to ignore the big obvious hole, turn around and step through it again. Like, what the hell? Who does this? Who can figure this out without trial and error? Granted, you don't need this key since you can just teleport up the wooden structure instead. However, if you did that, you'd be missing out on a couple items, enemies and secrets. But the worst example is the Icon of Sin. You get the idea to shoot its brain, since that's where the attacks are coming from, and it's glowing, and the pillar raises up to put you in the best spot to hit it. Except it doesn't. You can't hit the hole from that position. You have to instead have already been shooting as you were riding up the lift or when jumping down. And even if you figure that out, it only works if you have the right weapon for it. You might be tempted to use the chain gun or plasma rifle because they fire so quickly, or maybe even the BFG with a well-timed shot. Nope. Only one out of your eight weapons works, the rocket launcher. To be fair, they hint at this with a box of rockets on the floor, and it's unlikely you won't have it at this point. But to repeat an earlier question, is that a fun challenge? Why would the player assume most of their weapons don't work here? Even if they hit the hole with anything but rockets, there's no indication that it doesn't do anything. Heck, sometimes not even rockets damage it. It's such an extremely poorly designed final boss. At least the spider mastermind and mother demon went down quickly. This one drags on for far too long and leaves you with a sour taste in your mouth. What a way to end the game, huh? So overall, Doom 2 sounds awful, right? Well, obviously not. It's a mixed bag. For each of its flaws, the game has something amazing to counter it and vice versa. Levels may be barren, abstract and kind of ugly, but it really allows you to interpret them in different ways. Heck, I made a whole video about that. In fact, I really love Sandy's style of maps in general. 
They're much simpler both in terms of gameplay and visuals, but that just makes them easier to digest. For instance, I absolutely despise Episode 4 of Doom 1. I think it has some of the most annoying level design in the series. Yes, even Romero's levels, which are just very claustrophobic and really love toxic floors. But Sandy snaps? Sure, they may not always be that engaging, but they're easier to get into. And I'll always take an experience that leaves you hungry for more over one that overstays its welcome. Even thinking of some of the worst maps right now, like Monster Condo, all I can imagine is shooting down all those demons in the larger areas. It may look like garbage, but it plays beautifully. And the super shotgun may have made some of the other weapons obsolete, but come on, it's this super shotgun. Complaining about that would be like going to a buffet and saying that the chocolate cake is making the mashed potatoes look bad. The enemy encounters are also some of the very best Doom has to offer. Sometimes you slaughter several demons at once, other times you do the dance of death with a single one. And with so many enemy types, there are several interesting combinations. Hey, I made a whole video about that as well. The only truly inexcusable things are the cryptic progression and unfair moments. They are just as bad here as they were in Doom 64, if not more. But in the case of both games, if you know what to expect, you can prepare yourself for them. All in all, Doom 1 is the most well-rounded experience, with Doom 64 being a close second, and Doom 2 being the least. And yet, it's the most action-packed one. Good for newcomers? Hell no! But for returning fans, it's pretty good. Anyway, I'd love to hear what you think, especially if you never liked Doom 2 at all. I hope you understand that even if you heavily criticize something, that doesn't mean you can't be a fan of it. It just means you want it to be good and don't want to just ignore the flaws. And if you've enjoyed the video and would like to see more, then show me that by leaving a like, a comment, by subscribing and even by supporting me directly on Patreon. Anything is appreciated. But for now, thank you very much for watching, have a wonderful day and goodbye.